Uh, the traditional way of starting talks or events like this in Australia is what we call an acknowledgement of country, which is a recognition that the land on which we're meeting was settled by people who were not here first. And so I think part of our responsibility is to acknowledge the history that in being here, uh, in having a city like Austin, uh, just as in Australia and many other settled countries, there were other people here first. Uh, and so from what I've looked into in Austin, there were the Tonkawa, the Apache and the Comanche here at the time of Spanish settlement. And in my hometown in southeastern Australia, there's a little purple wedge in the southeast that's none of all country where I grew up. But back to property-based testing and software. Why does this matter? Why do we actually need software to do what we expect it to? Uh, this is kind of a rhetorical question. I think, I hope, that at least those of us who came to this talk are kind of on board with the idea that science is important that being able to trust our results and trust our software and trust our data is important. And this image, it turns out, is using a color map called Veritas, which actually came out of not just the SciPy community, but was first presented at this conference about four years ago. And I'm always excited when I see that that's gone out of the Python community entirely and into the rest of the scientific world. So this is our brain on software. It's something to do with surface curvature, and I won't pretend to understand the details. But the other side of this is that, my favorite quote, any reported scientific result could be wrong if data have passed through a computer. 50 years ago, this would not have been a problem. Maybe for a few fields in certain parts of physics or engineering, but for most fields, the idea that any reported scientific result where the data passed through a computer was wrong, would not have been such a problem because data passed through computers, but those computers were human workers, mostly women with extensive training in mathematics who very, very rarely got any credit for their work. But these days, almost every field of science and most other fields of human endeavor rely on computation in a way which is quite new. And so I'm talking about testing and how we can come to trust our research code and our data because code is now critical to our work, whether that's through the kind of libraries that form the foundation of the SciPy ecosystem or through the kind of one-off scripts or Jupyter notebooks that many of us would toss off in a day of research. And so I believe that we actually need not just faster but also more powerful ways to confirm that this code is doing what we expect it to. So, we're going to talk today about a technique called property-based testing, and this is the XKCD tax for the talk. You have some original task, perhaps that's testing, and then you write some more code, and then when automation takes over, your know, testing is improved and you have free time for other valuable activities. If you look at the economics literature, there's this thing called Jevon's paradox, though, which is when things get very cheaper, the total expenditure on them might actually increase because they're so much cheaper that the value you get out of them is now much higher. But before we talk about property-based testing, I think we actually need to talk about testing software more broadly. How do we do it and what's the point? So the first step is actually before we're writing tests, we want to write code that is testable. And that means things like our data should be immutable so we don't accidentally overwrite parts of it. And ideally in some kind of canonical standardized format so that we can quickly check whether two pieces of data are equivalent just by comparing them for equality rather than having to do a complicated transform. Our software, ideally, again, and I, I really don't want to say in any of this or give the impression that like some things are bad and people should feel bad about it. I have written an incredible amount of gnarly science code when I had no idea what I was doing and just kind of tossed off an exploratory thing, and those are incredibly valuable. But what I want to recognize, actually, is that this is also really difficult. And so all of us need better tools and better practices to get back to what we're doing. So we can define kind of interfaces once we're working in a more formal coding style, places where we know what the data should be on its way in and out of our important logic. We can separate the I.O., the thing where we deal with file formats, from the logic or the modeling or the scientific part of our code. We can try to pass through explicit arguments and record what versions of various libraries we're using. I really like to avoid any randomness in the core part of my code, uh, 
You can pass in most of the random data you need if you need, do need to randomize something. But that allows you to say that if I call this function with the same arguments, it should always do the same thing each time. If you don't have that property, it becomes very, very difficult to test anything. Because if it does something one day and something else the next, you go, well, is that a bug or is that just it's meant to do that? And finally, I like to embed lots and lots of assertions in my code. So an assertion is a statement in the Python programming language. It starts with the word assert, and then a space, and then some condition. And it's very simple. If the condition is true, nothing happens. If the condition is false, you get an explicit error. And that explicit error can be used to check that your understanding of the code is the same as what's actually happening in the code. And so a failing assertion can tell you when something outside of the function has misunderstood what the function believes about the data that it's processing. And so conceptually, my favorite definition of an assertion is that it's an expression in your program which should always be true unless there is a bug. And the bug can be in the interaction of the parts, not within any particular function. And so tests. Tests are, in the Python community, typically some collection of functions which will execute some of your code with some particular input and then check that they got the expected output. So some people like to do what they call test-driven development, where you write the tests first to specify what your code should do when it's written. Or you can do it the other way around. You can write your code and then write tests to check that it's doing what you expected. And if you're doing this, you might also write tests that check that your code is not doing something, which is a kind of plausible mistake that it could have done. Or in more mature projects, you often write tests to ensure that that bug you just fixed doesn't come back. Or at any rate, that when the bug does come back, you find out immediately, instead of when users come back to your issue tracker a few months later. And so there's some mnemonics about what a test should do, that it should arrange the data, perform an action, and then assert something about the result, or given, when, then. But the two key parts for me are that a test is something that actually executes your code. There's lots of great tools that don't do that, from Flake8 or MyPy or various other linters or formatters, but I wouldn't count those as tests, though they are useful tools. And ideally, a test should always fail if a bug is introduced and not fail otherwise. A test that doesn't fail when a bug is introduced is kind of disappointing. A test that does fail when there's no bug is a quick road to frustration and then deletion and then disillusionment with the whole idea of testing, which is probably even worse. So what do we test? Uh, in short, anything that you can observe from code. And if you're testing software, that's very many things. Typically, that's by turning your behavior into some kind of input or output data that you can do. But most importantly, you want to be testing things which are actually relevant to your users. Maybe that's to you. Maybe that's to your team. Maybe that's towards making sure that your results are reproducible in some way. But we don't want to test the details that no one cares about. We want to spend our effort testing the things that are important to us. And there are many other kinds of tests. Uh, we heard in the last talk about diff tests, where you can compare images or other data to make sure that they haven't changed unexpectedly. There's a cool technique called mutation testing, where the tool actually edits your source code and then reruns your test suite. And if the tests pass, that's demonstrated that there's a kind of potential change to your code which your test wouldn't find. There's doc tests to make sure that code examples still work and coverage tests which identify what parts of your code were not executed by your test suite. This can be super useful, uh, though I'm not a huge fan of percentage coverage because it means that deleting code which you didn't need but which is covered by tests makes the number go down even though the software is better. And I kind of prefer metrics that don't go down unless things are going worse. So, ooh, I think this is the wrong image. Um, Let's look at the library version, right? You, you can leave that bit to us, the authors of Hypothesis. So in property-based testing, instead of a human having to come up with an example, running the code, and then comparing it to an exact output, the user describes what kind of inputs should be valid. And that could be any pair of numbers. It could be an array of a particular shape. It could be a data frame. And then you hand it over to the Hypothesis engine, and that engine will generate many examples of kind of pseudo-random data, run your test case on each of them, and then if it finds an error, that is, if the function raises an exception, Hypothesis will report to you a minimal failing example. And that bit makes debugging a lot easier. This is what it looks like. You import 
the given decorator from Hypothesis, and you import the strategies module for describing your data. And in this case, we're testing a kind of dubious sorting function which sorts lists of integers really quickly. So we say given lists of integers with at least one integer, there's not much interesting about sorting the empty list. We can either compare our dubious function to a trusted function. In this case, the Python sorted built in. Or we can actually check that the output is correct without needing to know how to sort something at all. And that's particularly important in science where many of our models, the only way to get the output is actually to run the model. We don't know what the correct output should be in any way but running the code that we've written. So let's talk a little more about the hypothesis strategies for describing data and then tactics for writing tests with hypothesis. The first one, of course, is that there is the strategies module, right? And this describes many different kinds of things. Uh, I will just note, do use this, don't try to customize it. The internals are more complicated than they sound. So the simplest strategies that Hypothesis provides are for simple values, mostly built-in types or things from the standard library. You know, none, booleans, strings of various kinds, numbers of various kinds. But unlike tools in some other languages, Hypothesis doesn't just let you say, I need an integer. You can say, I need an integer that's more than 10, or I need any floating point number between plus and minus 100. For some, you also have arguments like for floating point numbers, do you want to allow not a number? Uh, you probably don't, to be honest. Who, who likes not a number? Or for date times, you can choose to supply a strategy for the time zones that might be acceptable. That one also you may want to disable. Time zones are not really much fun to work with. We have strategies for collections of things, whether it's lists or sets or dictionaries. And these typically take a strategy for the elements of the collection, as well as the size range of the collection, which is optional. Every strategy has a couple of methods attached if you want to customize it further. So the map method takes a function and returns another strategy. And that new strategy internally draws an element from the old strategy, applies the function to it, and then generates that. So you can trivially generate, for example, strings which are created by calling the string function on an integer. Or you can get only even numbers by mapping a multiplication by two over integers. Or you can very slowly, or somewhat more slowly, generate odd numbers by filtering out the even numbers. That one is slower though, because internally it's implemented as attempting to draw an integer and then checking whether it passes the filter. So naturally doing it by construction means the engine doesn't have to keep rejecting things and trying over and over again. For complicated things, so if you have a list of values which are the only valid values, you can use the sample from strategy. If you want to check permutations of some input, there's a permutation strategy. If you have recursive data, so tree structures or networks, that's supported in a couple of ways. You can take the union of strategies, so combine them with the binary or pipe operator. And so integers or text, in this example, will generate any integer or any Unicode string. But importantly, the minimal example of this will be the number zero, because the integer strategy is to the left of the text strategy. Uh, while in principle you could take the intersection of some strategies in practice, it's just intractable, so union only. But the final really nice one, which may come up for you, is what we call builds. And builds takes any kind of class or function that you might want to call and get the return value from, and then corresponding strategies as positional and keyword arguments, which are used to generate positional and keyword arguments to that thing. So if you have custom classes, you can generate those just as easily as anything else. Sometimes, though, you don't even have to describe to hypothesis what data you want because you've already got some kind of machine-readable description of it, whether that's a regular expression or a NumPy data type or even type annotations on some of your functions or classes. I really like using inferred strategies because it doesn't just save me the trouble of writing my own strategy descriptions, but it also means that I have a kind of dual test, that both my validation logic is sufficiently tight so that anything that passes through that will be accepted by my code, and vice versa that if anything is not handled by my code, that might tell me that my code is wrong or that my validation logic is too close. And we've got a bunch of these. It's a really useful pattern. Beyond just the standard library, we also have support for 
NumPy, for Pandas, for a number of other packages, and there are even more third-party extensions that you can download off PyPI. So, testing tactics time. There are a couple of different ways to write tests with Hypothesis. There's, of course, the traditional manual testing that we do. You write a script, you get some output, and then you eyeball it and you go, does this look right? Is the graph empty? Have I actually got data? There's auto-manual testing, the traditional form where you specify an exact input and check that you got the corresponding expected output. And then a couple of kind of property-based patterns for Hypothesis, what we call oracle tests, or fully specified things, partial specification, and then last of all, I'll talk about metamorphic testing. So an oracle is a function which will tell you if the output is correct for some corresponding input. Just like comparing to the sorted built-in earlier, and there are often implementations of NumPy or SciPy or other functions that you can compare yours to, at least for some inputs. Or importantly, you might have something like a faster version where you've added some performance optimizations or you're running it on multiple threads or over multiple machines. And so being able to compare that to the single threaded version, which is simpler or easier to understand, can really help. Or in other cases, it's very difficult to work out whether the answer to a question is correct, but relatively easy to start with an answer and construct a question which should deliver that output. Of course, you may then need to test the oracle as well, but it's worth it sometimes for the extra testing power you get. Sometimes you also have special cases where you can't fully specify the behavior in all cases, but you can specify it for certain special cases, whether that's continuous functions, monotonic data sets, constant things. And in those cases, it's often useful to do that more precise, specific test, even if it's only for a subset of inputs. The point of this, after all, is not a mathematical proof that our code is correct, but rather to give us increased confidence that it's easier to catch bugs in at least some cases. Alternatively, we might not even need to know what the answer is as long as we can put some bounds on it. So a probability, for example, should always be between zero and one. A temperature should always be above zero Kelvin, and you might even be able to be more specific than that. There are a lot of specifications that are like this for saving and loading data. Probably the most common one that I encounter, which is really useful for many people, is simply that you can save your data to disk or send it over the network, and then when you read it back in, you have the same data again. This one turns out to be surprisingly difficult. For example, CSV is a great format, but it does not preserve this for almost anything. And then there are a number of common properties, right, which I'll run through. These are often just useful for API design, or even when they're not, they're worth it because of the increased testing power that you get from it. The simplest one of all is simply that if I call a function with valid data, it should not crash. I say embarrassingly effective because this happens to me all the time. The function on the slide, for example, fails because the maximum of an empty list is undefined in Python. You might have invariants of your code, things which should not change if you perform some change for the input. So the output of sorting doesn't depend on the order of the input. Or if you call set, you've already made the elements unique and they should not change if you do it again. Round trips, I mentioned file, saving and loading earlier, but there's plenty of others. If you factorize and multiply or set an attribute and get an attribute or add something to your data set and then take it out, all of these things should reverse themselves in some way. They're complementary operations. And then there's things which are typically considered to be kind of untestable or intractable where there's no other way to get the answer, whether that's a black box of some kind, a simulation or a machine learning thing, or code that just has a lot of state in it is really awkward to test traditionally. So a metamorphic relation is what you call a complicated but useful property when you're publishing papers about it. A metamorphic property is where you don't know how the input relates to the output, but you do know how if you relate one input to one output and then change the input in a certain way, it then relates to the new output. So for example, for many simulations, you might not know exactly what the output should be, but you do know that if you double something or perturb something about the inputs, for example, temperature, then the output should also be roughly twice as hot. That's about all that there is to it, but it's a really powerful pattern, especially for complex models. We often, in science especially, don't know what the correct output is. That's why we have to run the model. 
but we can check things like, is mass or energy conserved across model time steps? What should change if things get perturbed or shuffled? For neural networks, this is even more serious. A neural network is like a system of some tens of thousands of parameters, and I always think of the old quip, right? If you give me four parameters, I can fit an elephant. If you give five parameters, I can make the trunk wiggle. But there's still some stuff we can do. You can embed assertions through all your th code, you can use simple properties across steps, and you can test things like, does the model weight update when I actually perform a training step? Stateful testing through time, you can model things as finite state machines, and then check that they're doing what you expect, that certain transitions all work. And it looks pretty simple with Hypothesis 2. Last thing, since I'm running low on time, you can check the statistics, so see what Hypothesis has actually called your function with, whether that's timing or performance or just what data has been used. And if you like print debugging as much as I do, you can use the note function for that. Hypothesis goes quickly, generate lots of data, and that takes longer. There's the settings thing, so if you want to change the timeout or configure the number of examples, that all works. And Hypothesis is not flaky. So thoroughly out of time, I would love to talk to you. We'll be running sprints, and thanks very much. <laughs>